Hi everyone, happy Wednesday. So I'm on chapter four of Who Loves Amelia Earhart? We're gonna continue reading. Chapter four, Amelia takes off. With her pilot's license in hand, Amelia flew in some air shows. Most pilots were men, so a young woman attracted a lot of attention. Amelia didn't like to be on display, but she worked in the shows to earn money. She had to keep on flying. Then Amelia's friend and teacher, Nita Snook, got married. Just as Amelia feel, feared her friend's flying days were over, Nita would now be a wife and mother. So Amelia needed another instructor or teacher. She teamed up with an expert named Monty Montijo. Monty had flown in the army. He also did stunt work flying in the movies. Monty taught Amelia a lot. She even learned to do tricks in the air, like huge upside-down loops. Now she felt like trying for a second record. Amelia wanted to see how high she could go. Amelia didn't tell anyone her plans, but she had an instrument on her plane. It measured how high above the ground her plane was. In the early 1920s, planes didn't fly as high as they do today. One reason was because the cockpits, or where the, where, um, the pilots were, were open. At higher altitudes or higher up in the air, there's not as much oxygen to breathe. Amelia knew she could pass out if she went too high, but she was willing to risk it. And here are some of the planes flying high up in the air. It took two attempts or tries. Amelia flew through fog and sleet. She finally made it to 14,000 feet, more than two and a half miles high. Then her plane's engine engine began to fail. Amelia brought her plane down fast. She was just barely able to make a safe landing, but she had her record. Although Amelia loved to fly, she soon found out that she couldn't su just support herself by flying. So she had to have a job. She could not support herself financially or with money by flying. There were no big airplanes or air airlines yet. People did not travel by plane. In fact, most people never expected to ride it in a plane. In 1924, Amelia temporarily gave up on her dream. She sold the canary and used the money to buy a car. You might guess that Amelia would pick a practical automobile like the Ford Model T. She didn't. She bought a fancy yellow convertible. There's her fancy car. If she couldn't fly in the air, she would at least have the feeling of flying across the ground. She named her car Yellow Peril, and she and her mother drove across the country and headed for the East Coast, which is where we live, actually. Amelia went back to Columbia University, but again, it wasn't for long. She had to drop out again, as usual. The money, money as usual, the problem was money. Sam Chapman followed Amelia out East. That was her friend from before. He proposed marriage again. It was tempting. But Amelia was now 28 years old. Most people thought a woman this age was already an old maid. So back in the day, a lot of people, just like a lot of women had to get married at a young age. That was just like the tradition. And people who didn't get married before like 30 were too old to get married. But that's not really the case anymore because a lot of older people get married now. If, women, if Amelia married Sam, she wouldn't have to worry much about money. However, Sam would want her to stay at home and have children, and Amelia had to decide. To her, the choice was very clear. Amelia told her sister Meryl of her decision. I don't want to marry him, Amelia said. I don't want to marry anyone. Amelia couldn't stand the thought of giving up her freedom. The next job Amelia found was in Boston. She worked at the Denison House, where she took care of poor children. Amelia really liked the job. She knew she was doing something worthwhile. Flying was now limited to the weekends, but she watched other pilots with interests. In 1927, a man named Charles Lindbergh made news all over the world. He was the first pilot to fly alone across the Atlantic Ocean. It took him more than 33 hours to fly from Long Island, New York, to Paris. A woman from London named Amy Guest wanted to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. Guest was not a pilot, so she would set the record by just by being a passenger in a plane, in, in the plane. George Putnam, a book publisher in New York, was going to oversee her attempt. However, Amy's family would not let her go. So George Putnam had to find another woman. And this time, he wanted a pilot. Dun, dun, 
dun. Who do you think it's going to be? All right, here's a little bit of a side story about Charles Lindbergh. Charles Lindbergh started out as a barnstormer. That's what pilots who did daring trips in early shows in the 1920s were called. But in May 21st, 1927, Charles left his tricks behind and entered the record books. No one had ever made a solo trip across the Atlantic before. So if it's solo, it means that it's by himself. No one was in the plane with him. It was very dangerous. His plane, called the Spirit of St. Louis, was only 28 feet long. Lindbergh's biggest problem was staying awake, so he'd stick his head out of the plane's window for blasts of cold air. He also kept reminding himself that if he slept, he would die. So he made it across the Atlantic Ocean, and he didn't fall asleep, because that would have been scary. But yeah, he lived. All right, um, back to Amelia's story. So Putnam, Putnam, the guy who was trying to get a girl to go across the Atlantic Ocean, ran a big publishing company, so he made books. And he knew a lot of people. He was really good at making deals. Putnam asked a friend to find the right woman from the job, and the friend found Amelia Earhart. So let's see what she's going to do next. Chapter 5. Amelia becomes a hero. Amelia met with both George Putnam and Amy Gust in New York. Sorry, I need a sip of my coffee. They both thought she was perfect. Attractive, polite, well-educated. She got the job. The job was actually not nearly as good as it sounded. Amelia wouldn't get paid, which is kind of a problem. Um, a man named Vilmer Stoltz would fly the plane, so she didn't even get to fly. This is dumb. He'd get $20,000, and although Amelia was called the captain, she was really just a passenger, so she didn't even get to fly the plane. She didn't get paid. This is kind of, I don't know. Why did Amelia agree? First, no woman had ever crossed the Atlantic by airplane. The experience alone was enough to make Amelia go. Amelia summed up her feelings with a letter to a friend. Quote, when a great adventure is offered to you, you don't refuse it. That's all. Amelia also hoped that if the trips were successful, all the attention could bring her other flying jobs. So this is like, this is like an introductory job. It's like your first job. Like it's not exactly what you want, but it's going to help you get better jobs. The flight was very dangerous. Charles Lindbergh had made the trip safely, but 14 other people had died trying to cross the ocean. There had been, three had been women. Still, two other women pilots were ready, already planning to try it. So Amelia had to move quickly if she wanted to be the first. The plane, called the Friendship, took off from Boston on June 3, 1928. However, the crew had to land in Canada because of bad weather. Many days went by. The Friendship was still not able to take off. Amelia discovered another problem. Her pilot, Vilmer Stoltz, drank too much. If Vilmer got drunk, she knew he couldn't fly the plane. But if they did not take off soon, Amelia would lose the record. It was now or never. On June 16th, Amelia made a, de a decision. I know someone's birthday is June 16th. She told Vermeer to get ready to fly, and they were leaving the next day no matter what. On the morning of June 17th, Amelia sent a cable to George Putnam back in Boston, and the cable read, Violet, cheerio, A-E. Violet was a code word. It meant that the friendship was taking off. So, um, she sent a cable, which is kind of like a letter, but it's like on a telephone. So basically they send words through telephone, kind of like an email, but from like a long time ago. Although the long flight with Vilmar Schultz, through the long flight, Vilmar Schultz and his co-pilot Slim Gordon took turns flying the plane. Amelia wrote notes in her journal. After 20 hours of flying, they knew they were low on fuel. Could they find time, find land in time? The answer was yes. The friendship touched down in Blurry Point, South Wales, 20 hours and 40 minutes after taking off the Canadian coast. They've done it! On June 18th, 1928, Amelia Earhart became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. Yay! Really quick, I'm going to show you where she landed. So she started in Boston... They went to Canada, and then they went all the way across the Atlantic to this place called South in South Wales, which is in England. What came next was a surprise for Amelia. The trip made her an instant hero. Amelia hadn't flown the plane, but people still thought she was very brave. In London, Amelia was entertained by the rich and famous. She had tea with royalty. On her return to America, Amelia was met with 
even greater excitement. There are parades and speeches and crowds of people. Check out, check out that parade. Crowds of people came to see her and the brave, the brave female. Many people compared Amelia Earhart to the famous pilot Charles Lindbergh. They thought that Amelia, tall and slim, even looked like Lindbergh. Amelia's nickname became Lady Lindy. George Putnam liked this a lot. He knew he could make Amelia even more famous. So he was the guy from before, remember? All the attention was hard on Amelia. Sometimes she was frightened by the push of people trying to get near her. However, Amelia was a smart woman. She knew she would have to be in the spotlight if she wanted to fly planes and break records. Amelia also knew that if people got excited about flying, then the tiny airline business would grow. Amelia hoped to be part of that business. If Amelia made speeches, she would also be paid, which is good for her, right? That meant she could buy another airplane. With her own plane, she could set more records. That would lead to more speeches and more money. For the first time in her life, Amelia started to believe she could actually make a living or have a job by flying. George Putnam became Amelia's manager. He set up lots of public appearances for her. Oh gosh, this is a really long chapter. In six months, Amelia made over 100 speeches and gave more than 200 interviews. Amelia did not complain about her busy schedule. She was given a new car for an appearance by an auto show. She also made money by letting companies use her name to, use her name to advertise their products. The fur-lined leather Amelia Earhart flying suit became very popular in a New York department store. Amelia also became an editor for Cosmopolitan magazine and wrote a column about aviation. Amelia didn't really like to write, but the articles brought more publicity. Many of the magazine's readers thought Amelia was a good role model for young girls. By 1929, Amelia was the best-known female pilot in America. All right, we're going to stop there. So we're halfway through Chapter 5, and what we'll do is we'll do Chapter 5 and Chapter 6 for the next video. So I will see you guys on Monday. I will post another video, and I hope you guys have a great weekend.